Good morning, everyone. I'm just getting ready to live stream it on Facebook. It seems to take a little longer, but let's get going. So um, we begin chapter 15 of our study of deep learning uh, today. It's uh, the third chapter on research in deep learning. And we'll uh, be discussing a, an important topic, which is called representation learning. Uh, it's gonna take us, I think, uh, maybe three lectures total, including today. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll begin by uh, what is representation learning? What is the scope of the topic? And then we'll start getting into individual topics there. So we can begin by asking as to uh, the role of representation in deep learning. And of course, it's a very central one. After all, what is deep learning? It's a layer-wise uh, learning of a neural network. And uh, what does each layer do? It's finding some kind of representation. And so um, uh, representation is key. Why just one layer will not do is because that's just uh, one level of abstraction and deep learning thrives on several levels of abstraction. So we'll uh, look at that. So we will actually begin by talking about the importance of representation in general. Uh, we are all familiar with how certain representations make make it easier to solve problems compared to other representations. A simple one is uh, supposing I give you uh, a mathematics problem where the uh, numbers, I just ask you to do some division, where I ask you to, uh, I give you the numbers in Roman numerals. And I say, well, we have one Roman numeral, which is CCIII. -I -I. Please uh, divide this by another Roman numeral, VII, -I -I, and, and give me the answer. Uh, of course, uh, you might be well versed in uh, mathematics of Roman numerals, but most people would uh, prefer to convert it to, into another representation. When I say CCII, -I -I, you'd convert it into equivalent decimal representation and say, well, that's two, 203 and divide it by VII, that is uh, seven. So I'm asking you to divide 203 by seven and you will make a arithmetic uh, division and say the answer is 29. So, the task is that of division, but you found that the algorithm that you have in mind is simpler if you convert the number into a different representation and the problem is solved in a pretty straightforward way in a decimal representation. Right? Similarly, a lot of different tasks in uh, AI and machine learning. The input is <coughs> in some representation that is not suitable to the kind of task that you would like to solve. Sir, the, let's say a 10 class problem of 10 handwritten digits. Hello. Uh, yes. Yes, I wanted to add one thing. In the first project that we made, which was FizzBuzz, I tried to change the representation from decimal to base three. Ah. Which helped me uh, do it better because if it is zero in the uh, least significant bit, it is Fizz and uh, something like that. So that helped a lot in there. Okay. Very good point. That is that is that an example of representation learning? I I suppose so. The, that's the main point that uh, we are trying to drive home, is some representations are more suited for the tasks to be solved than other representations. So you actually are reinforcing that issue by saying some representation you chose, uh, actually uh, helped you solve the problem. So we're just stating it in a general terms right now that throughout uh, our ordinary day-to-day -day living, we find that some representations are better than others. So yes, that's exactly the kind of thing. So um, the uh, decimal is more suited 
then Roman, perhaps that's why Roman numerals were abandoned, because they were not suitable for so many uh, kinds of operations. And when you convert it, the task becomes easy. So I'll give you a few more examples of uh, how certain representations are better. We'll also look at uh, uh, inserting into a, uh, into a, a, a sorted list. Supposing I say, here's a sorted list of numbers, and I give you another number, please insert this number into the sorted list. Uh, the complexity of that problem is uh, said to be order log n, since it's already a sorted list. The number of uh, tests you need to do is log n number of tests. Uh, and uh, uh, Actually, it is actually uh, the order n for that. You have to, you have, it's a sorted list. You have to find find where it would fit in. If you have a tree structure for it, it would be order log n. We'll look at that example specifically. We go from n to log n. And so also, if you have a, a classification problem in feature space, you need to separate the classes. If the classes uh, sometimes need a quadratic representation. That is, you need a circle to separate the two classes. But if you change the representation from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates, you find, ah, oh, I can just draw a straight line just by changing the representation. Similarly, in a more classic problem, handwritten digit recognition, or uh, you're trying to classify different types of animals, you would start with an image which is high dimensional, and uh, finding a solution in that might be pretty complex. But if you map it down to a representation such as that's found by a neural network, you would find, ah, oh, that's a linear classifier. You could simply classify things by drawing straight lines between, between them in this uh, different space. So there is uh, many, many examples of how a representation might make the problem easier. So we'll begin by the importance of representation. And we will uh, then uh, look at uh, what sorts of representations are learned. And uh, in deep learning, we have uh, layers corresponding to different levels of representation. And we'll look at a particular method which says, what if we learn each representation separately? That's how uh, deep, deep learning actually uh, the revolution of deep learning actually commenced like that, saying, oh, we could use uh, several layers. We could uh, learn them layer by layer by layer, keep adding one layer to the next layer to the next layer, and maybe that solves the problem well. That's called as um, layer-wise uh, learning, and actually it's referred to as greedy layer-wise learning. And actually there's a variant of it called as uh, greedy layer-wise pre-training, where we say, use it with some data set that you have. Uh, maybe it's an unsupervised learning problem. And you can then use it for the supervised learning problem that you have at hand. So there are all these issues, everything revolves around representation. So that's the topic for today, is the basics of representation. And then in subsequent uh, lectures on representation learning, we go into more uh, interesting topics such as uh, disentanglement of all these underlying factors <laughs> that cause the data to look like what it is. But there are all these independent underlying factors. How, how can we get them? So all these topics. Okay, so we'll begin. Let me put up the slide, slides now for uh, the topic of uh, uh, representation learning. Okay, hopefully the uh, slides are visible now on representation learning. Okay, so this is a, a big chapter, just like uh, 
natural language processing was a big chapter. Representation learning is a big chapter. So today is largely about role of representation in deep learning. Then we will uh, uh, discuss greedy layer wise unsupervised pre-training. That's also a topic we'll cover today. Next lecture on Monday will be on transfer learning and domain adaptation, uh, which is again an important topic, how you can transfer the learning you've done in a particular application and move it to another one. And then uh, section three, semi-supervised disentangling of causal factors. That's the topic I just mentioned, which is uh, something like speech is uh, an entanglement of many uh, causal factors such as the timber, the uh, words being spoken, the pitch, and so on. And then uh, the role of distributed representation versus other representations, and uh, how we get expon exponential gain by, by introducing depth, and uh, how can we get some clues to underlying causes? That's a very powerful statement of uh, learning causes. Uh, from a data set, what's causing this? Okay, this slide lists uh, three different tasks, which uh, should be fairly self-explanatory as to how uh, representation influences uh, the difficulty of the task. The first one is on performing arithmetic. Supposing I uh, stated the problem as divide CCX by VI, all right, uh, by using long division. Um, and th those are Roman numerals. Uh, it's a hard, uh, for most, most people, it would be uh, hard to do that task uh, in Roman numerals as opposed to converting it into CCX stands for 210, VI stands for six. So performing the uh, division long division of 210 by six in decimal is much simpler. So the task is performing arithmetic, but the representation is either Roman or, or decimal. Okay, the second example is uh, uh, inserting an entry into a sorted list, this is the one I mentioned earlier on. For a sorted list, uh, the complexity is order n, it's a list of n items. But if I organize the n uh, numbers in the form of what's called as a red-black tree, uh, in the red-black tree, the left numbers are smaller than the parent and the right is larger than the parent. We have carefully structured it. And these numbers are uh, like running from one through 27, one, six, eight, 13, like that. It's been organized in the form of a red-black tree. And uh, if you organize your numbers like this, and I give you a number and ask you to insert it, the number of steps you need is only order log n instead of order n. So the complexity is dramatically reduced. So the point here is the representation uh, is uh, in the form of a tree makes the task much more efficient. Okay. So that's the same point earlier on. It's more efficient using uh, uh, using uh, Arabic or, or, uh, or decimal system. Uh, and the final example here is uh, classification. That uh, in the first uh, uh, picture here, there are green and uh, blue dots. And uh, if with Cartesian coordinates, the, that's the usual uh, Euclidean uh, space, uh, we have the blue dots enclosed uh, by a ring of green dots. And uh, the task is of quadratic complexity. And uh, the other one is uh, linear discriminant, where the task uh, is, uh, uh, so if you convert that into a polar, a polar coordinates, the task becomes a linear discriminant, which is uh, much less complex in terms of the input, just drawing a straight line as opposed to drawing a circle in the two. Anyway, these are all examples of how uh, uh, complexity of solving the problem is reduced. And the same happens in a deep learning network that typically we start with a problem that looks pretty complex to be able to tell whether the input is a cat or a dog or a horse or a cow or what have you. Seems like a complicated problem. 
the deep learning layers reduce the complexity, eventually bringing it to a last layer, which is going to be solved using softmax, which is essentially a, a linear classifier. We are uh, determining a value, of which discriminant value is the highest. It's a linear classifier. So we convert uh, a, a fairly difficult problem into a straightforward problem by bringing it down to a representation that is captures the most important features of the object. Okay. So this whole uh, uh, chapter is about our uh, discussion of representation in deep learning. Uh, how the notion of representation is useful in deep architecture design and uh, how also learning algorithms share statistical strength across different tasks. So it's not like we just need for that task, we can share strength from other tasks. For instance, from an unsupervised task to a supervised task. Unsupervised task is just having a collection of data with no annotation. And supervised one is uh, with annotation, where uh, we are, uh, we have labels such as that's a horse and that's a, that's a dog and that's a cat and so on, that's a supervised task. So if we have a large number of uh, unlabeled examples, we can somehow do unsupervised learning with them to, to learn the distribution of these and, uh, and use them to, uh, to improve our supervised learning performance. We could also uh, learn across uh, different modalities, multiple modalities. For instance, uh, we could go across from handwriting to speech, uh, to type text, those are different modalities, or domains, you know, one is a medical domain, a sports domain, and so on. And uh, Transfer learn, learn knowledge to tasks with few examples. So you might have a specialized medical application of a particular type of cancer where, where you don't have many examples. Uh, can we learn from other uh, tasks where you have enough samples and can you leverage that? That's called, that's, that's what we do in transfer learning. So all of these come, play a role here in, uh, in representation. So, so discussion here is going to be begin with reasons for success of representation learning in deep learning. So why has deep learning had so much of success in representation learning? And uh, it, the answer is it's twofold. One is the theoretical advantages of distributed representation and deep representation. So there are inherent theoretical advantages when you have a representation that is distributed. We talked about this earlier on, uh, a symbolic representation versus a distributed representation, that uh, you have several units together defining a concept as opposed to the concept being an individual one. And deep representations are, are uh, representations which capture in a hierarchical way uh, deeper and deeper or finer and finer characterizations. And uh, so the other part is uh, underlying uh, assumptions about data generation process. That's the unsupervised learning part. So what is the uh, data generating process? That is, what is the distribution of the data? And uh, what are the causal factors underlying the data? So these are some of the things that play a role in our entire discussion of this chapter. So we can then ask, well, this is all about machine learning and uh, you are talking about representations. So what is a good representation for machine learning? Just like we said, good representation for arithmetic is uh, decimal compared to Roman or uh, a red black tree versus a sorted list for inserting and so on. So what is a good representation for machine learning? The answer is that the representation makes the subsequent learning easier. And the choice usually depends on the subsequent learning task. So what is the task at hand? And so 
the deep learner would actually find the representation based on what is the task at hand. If the task is about handwritten digit recognition, it learns what is the representation that is most suited for that. Just to recall, we are dealing here with deep learning or uh, feed forward nets typically. A feed forward net network, all it is doing is computing a function of x. x is the input, some high dimensional input. And that function f of x is computed as a composition of functions f3 of f2 of f1 of x. Remember that this is the complete nesting here. f1 is a representation obtained from x. f2 operates on that representation and obtains another representation. And f3 operates on that representation to give us the final f of x. So that's what a feed forward neural network does. And there are two diagrams below that shows that same idea. In the first diagram, we're moving from left to right. Uh, there's only one hidden layer here. And that's just uh, input is transformed by uh, F, uh, uh, F1 of X. And that's the final layer is the, is the uh, F of X, right? That is F2 of F1 of X. The same thing is shown over here on the right side where an input X is converted to a latent representation H to an output Y. This is a very simple, interesting representation to drive home the point of uh, how a suitable representation is learned for a very simple task. This is the task a uh, logical operation of exclusive or, right? XOR is exclusive or. It's an operation defined on um, binary inputs. If I have uh, two bits as input, input X0 and input X1, each of them can take on only two values, zero or one. Then the exclusive or is, provides an output of one, only when the inputs are not the same. For zero, one, and one, zero is input, it gives the answer one. If the inputs are the same, that it's zero, zero, or one, one, then the output is zero. That's the definition of exclusive or. And famously, this problem cannot be solved by a linear classifier. I have two inputs, one output. Can you draw a straight line on this input space? You can think of the input space as a uh, the diagram shown here, which uh, has, uh, let me expand this out. Yeah. So we have uh, the space shown here, the two diagrams here. First one is input x naught and the other one is input x1, the x-axis and y-axis. And uh, here we have a situation, the first diagram says uh, either input is a one, and uh, uh, the output is uh, one uh, when uh, both of them, when, when both of them are not the same. And the other one, the output is zero, when both of them are the same. And uh, it shows a linear separation of the space of X naught and X one. So this is the definition of H naught. We have, we've got a neural network here. Maybe I should, I should refer to this neural network first. We have X naught and X one here. And then we have a neural network with this hidden layer, hidden units, H naught and H one. H0 and H1 together compute the value. So you need a hidden layer rather than a simple linear discriminant to solve this problem. And what is it that H0 and H1 learn or what are shown in these diagrams here? Right. So H0, when the input is X0, the output is one in this region. The output is zero. So that's what this H0 does. Similarly, H1, the output is one in this region up here and it is zero in the other region. So what it is showing here is that 
although x or exclusive or famously cannot be solved by a linear function the network uh, discovers a representation that is uh, linearly separable so it says uh, if we have h not and h1 then i can solve the problem by multiplying h not by plus 1 and multiplying h1 by minus 2 and adding uh, h not minus 2 h1 if it is greater than zero or less than zero, you, can, you decide to be zero or one. So this is a linear classifier at this level. And what is H naught and H1? Are they are finding the values that can sub be subject to a linear classifier. So it's a, it's a simple example, but it brings home the point that even though the initial task is not linearly separable, by finding two hidden values, H0 and H1, the problem becomes linearly separable, such as by multiplying the inputs by weights and adding them up gives you the answer, which you can threshold to one or the other, which you could not have done because the task is not linearly separable to the original exclusive or task. Here is another one. Seems like a really hard problem. This is a diagram on the left, which shows white points in the form of a spiral here. And you can barely see the other one. There are black points, which also form a spiral. So there are two spirals, one inside the other. So supposing we wanted a classifier that would uh, give a value of uh, one for the white points and zero for the black points. What kind of classifier do you need? And uh, this looks like a pretty complex problem, cannot be solved by a linear classifier, the original input space. On this side is all black and this side, uh, this side is zero, this side is one. So we definitely need a nonlinear classifier. And if we train an appropriate neural network, here's a neural network, it's a feed forward network. There are two inputs, X and Y are the coordinates. There's a one hidden layer here, another hidden layer here. There is an output layer here. And uh, at each layer, for example, each of these are linear classifiers, right? So there are one, two, three, four, five units on the hidden layer one. And those five units are illustrated at the bottom of the diagram here, hidden layer one. Each of them is linear, each of them is linear. And those are subject to other linear classifiers with uh, these inputs coming in here, hidden layer two. And uh, that allows us from one layer to the next layer, you now get some non-linearity. And uh, eventually to the output layer, we end up uh, with uh, black regions and white regions. So when the points fall in the white region, it is labeled as one and the points fall in the black region, it is labeled as zero. So one can get pretty sophisticated and nonlinear classifiers by layering. Uh, and, but the eventual uh, classifier becomes a fairly straightforward classifier, which uh, is solved by linear operation at the final point based on the kinds of representations we obtain. And that actually gives a nonlinear separation in the original space. That's what we are looking at. So this is again how a deep learning network takes a complex problem and through multiple layers is able to generate uh, uh, a fairly good solution in that representation space. So let's then move on to talk about uh, what happens in a standard supervised uh, feed forward learning classifier? So the last layer of the network is a linear classifier such as softmax regression classifier. And the rest of the network learns representation for the classifier. This is showing uh, an input here, input image. I think this looks like a cat here. And we have a neural network with uh, a couple of hidden layers here, all right? One, two, maybe even this is a hidden layer and uh, which is the softmax uh, operation is performed here to yield the labels 
of dog and bird and cat and horse and cow, etc. And this is showing the softmax operation, which takes whatever the values have been generated here. We are normalizing all of them exponentially, taking the exponential of these values, dividing by the sum of all the values to normalize them and gives you the probability for each of these. So that's a linear classifier at the last stage, but the deep learning network takes a complex input image and produces a, such a representation where the task of classification is made easy. So the hidden layer properties are that every hidden layer takes on properties that make the classification easier. So classes not linearly separable in input features may become linearly separable in the last hidden layer. And the point that's being made here is that last layer could also be another model. We always talk about softmax as the last layer. So, and it could also be another model such as a nearest neighbor classifier. So we bring it to a fairly straightforward problem. Uh, and uh, features in the penultimate layer should learn different properties depending on the type of last layer. So if you're going to be using a nearest neighbor classifier, then uh, the features that are produced by the network, uh, it would learn what, what are the appropriate features for a nearest neighbor classifier. So, so in that sense, the entire representation learning is uh, focused on how to, how to bring it to a place where the problem can be solved well by the particular method you have for the last stage. So then we ask these questions, how do we specify the representation? And uh, for that, uh, we list three items here. One is supervised learning of feed forward networks and uh, no imposition of any conditions in the learned feature. So we could say, well, we just learn these things in a feedforward network with no conditions imposed. And uh, other representation learning algorithms uh, actually impose them. In density estimation, we encourage the hidden units to be independent. Uh, or we have unsupervised deep learning algorithms and uh, uh, they have a main training objective, which is to learn the best possible uh, description of the probability distribution. So we are, we are now going to be uh, encountering more unsupervised learning problems, which is uh, to learn the distribution of the data, irrespective of the task. And saying uh, we could have, the, the goal of an unsupervised learning task would be to maximize uh, the probability associated uh, with the representation. So it's called the maximum likelihood representation of the data set. Right. And uh, so uh, we could, we could uh, and so we have a criterion there, which is called the maximum likelihood, uh, the log likelihood criterion, we call it. We maximize that or minimize the uh, negative log likelihood. And we come up with a representation. And, uh, so they learn a representation in like in supervised learning, your goal is to come up with the best possible representation. A side effect would be uh, the representation we use for, for the classification problem. So regardless of how representation was obtained, it can be used for another task and multiple tasks, supervised, unsupervised, can share a representation. So there is a trade-off in these representations between preserving as much information about the input as possible, right? So you want to preserve as much of the information as possible in the data when you create the representation. We talked about this uh, with auto encoders to be able to reconstruct the input. We're talking it about it more generally now, not just auto encoders. And, uh, we may also impose some criteria saying, I would like these features to be independent uh, and uh, which makes it uh, easier to deal with it later. And we also bring in this idea of semi-supervised learning. And 
This is uh, motivated by the fact that often we have very little labeled data and very large amounts of unlabeled data. And we say representation learning is a way of performing unsupervised and semi-supervised learning. So we could be doing the learning with a lot of unlabeled data. We could have some labeled data. And uh, training on uh, labeled data may result in severe overfitting. So you're learning exactly that. You've got this label. And semi-supervised learning may actually be better where you're not just learning on the labeled data, but you have a learning going on on other data, which is not labeled. So you're just given all this and it learns something about the nature of things. And that might actually turn out to be better. Which kind of makes us a little bit of a side trip here into human animal learning. If you think about it, humans and animals learn with few labeled samples. We're not repeatedly told that's a cat, that's a cat, that's a cat. Uh, just a few looks at it, maybe the baby will learn that that's a cat. And uh, so how do we do this? Uh, we don't do this with a great deal of supervised learning. A lot of unsupervised learning, all kinds of observations are made on data. Yeah, but there is some supervised learning, so we combine the two. But uh, as I mentioned, this is all a research topic here, representation learning. So. We do, do not yet know how this is possible, how uh, animals and humans learn with few labeled samples. So we're always looking for that analogy. This particular diagram here, not that we are experts on human anatomy and so on, what it's showing on the left side is uh, a human brain. And uh, it has got Yeah, it has got parts labeled. These are all standard labels that uh, they use in anatomy. V1, V2, V4, IT, LGN. They have some standard expansions. Uh, I suppose V, v might be ventricle, ventricular, right? So on. And uh, so it says uh, there is some analogy. And between the kinds of features in deep learning. So V1 uh, works with a visual field from the eye, the image goes off to the visual field here, goes to V2 and then to V4 and then to IT over here, where faces and objects are recognized. So it's going through LG1 to V1 to V2 to V4 to IT. Maybe corresponding to uh, a deep learning system where one level is just dealing with edges, the next level with shapes, and the next level with objects, and the final uh, level with faces, and you recognize people. So there is an analogy here. Uh, the reason I bring this up here is uh, that's the same kind of thing we're talking about, that human beings are able to learn representations, not just based on uh, label samples, but also a large number of unlabeled samples. We are constantly thinking about these kinds of issues, how to model this well. So the hypothesis, so what could it be? You know, you are a researcher wanting to model all this. Hypothesis for learning with few samples. What, what are some approaches where you're trying to formalize what could be going on? And we could say, well, the brain may use a very large ensemble of classifiers. So it is uh, using different neural networks. And uh, by having different neural networks and combining their results, maybe it's doing well. Or the brain may be using uh, Bayesian inference techniques. Bayesian inference comes in whenever you have insufficient amount of uh, data. So when you have only a few samples and you want to learn from it, uh, Bayesian inference is a powerful way of doing it because you bring in what's called as priors. So even though you don't know, uh, you don't have that much data to define everything, you have some idea of what's what could be going on. So that's called a prior. So you have a prior on the parameters of the distribution and then you combine the likelihood with the prior to get what's called as a posterior. 
So the brain may be doing something like Bayesian inference. The third one is that it leverages unsupervised or semi-supervised learning. So it could be that, that some of it is supervised and a lot of it is unsupervised. Semi-supervised means some part of it has been supervised. So these are all approaches. A nice dissertation topic, someone looking for something would be to compare all these approaches, ensembles and Bayesian inference and uh, combining unsupervised, semi-supervised, would make a nice fundamental contribution to learning with few samples. Okay, so there are many ways to leverage unlabeled data. And uh, we focus on hypothesis that unlabeled data can be used to learn a good representation. So one more comment about uh, the role of unsupervised learning. Whenever people describe uh, what is a deep learning network, what is deep learning, what is machine learning, we always talk about supervised learning. Unsupervised learning actually has had a, an important role it actually revived the deep neural networks, having layers. It was really unsupervised learning, enabling training a deep supervised network without specialization such as convolution or recurrence. So historically, it was uh, actually uh, uh, unsupervised learning. And the next section we'll talk about, which is called greedy learning, where unsupervised learning played a role. And uh, it is also a canonical example of a representation learned for one task can be used for another task. And uh, the first task could be unsupervised learning, trying to capture the shape of a distribution. Okay, this data is distributed in this way. Supposing I give you a lot of handwritten digits, zero through nine, and it didn't tell you which one is zero, which one is one, which one is two, which is three, which is four, which is five, which is six, seven, eight, nine. We could just uh, look at the data, how, how they appear uh, in uh, a feature space, maybe pixel space. And naturally, you would find that the zeros kind of roughly go together and ones go together and twos go together. Even though you don't know anything about those handwritten digits, they're saying, looks like there are about 10 different groups here. Aha, uh -huh, yes, but we don't know which one is which. Unsupervised learning is telling us there are 10 groups of data here. I don't know what they correspond to. And then you give a pointer and saying that one is a nine. Ah, okay. So that whole group must be a nine. Like that. So unsupervised learning can be used to leverage supervised learning. So even though we learned it all using unsupervised learning, we now know what a nine looks like. Although I gave you one example. I said, here's a nine. Or similarly, I said, that's a five. That one example is a five. Oh, okay, then all of these which look like that must be fives. Or I suppose we can use this for learning, uh, learning a different language. Let's say you're learning Chinese and you don't know anything about Chinese. And uh, you would have uh, somebody told you, hey, that's, that's an example of a particular character. And you would say, well, okay, from now on, I know roughly that shape corresponds to that character. And, uh, you, you are not given lots of examples of that character. Right. So this is the, a bit of the overview. So I'm going to switch the slide deck onto this uh, next one. All right. Okay, this one is called Greedy layer-wise unsupervised pre-training. That's a very long title. So let me parse what all this means. First word is greedy, right? A greedy algorithm does not look at a long-term objective. It just looks at the immediate, uh, immediate next thing and uh, tries to grab as much as possible. This is like a network, a, a deep learning network with several layers. The greedy one says, let's just look at the first layer and do it as well as possible and ignore the effect on the subsequent layers. So that would be a greedy algorithm. 
and layer wise okay greedy layer wise okay that reflects that this is going to be about learning layer by layer and you're being greedy about it saying ignore the later layers do the best possible for that layer and it is about unsupervised unsupervised means no labeled data i give you some data and uh, pre training means uh, this is uh, data without any kind of uh, problem to be solved i just want to learn on this data set so that in the future i can use it for uh, the task i really want to train it on so in a sense this could be for initially initializing all the weights of the network that's pre training where, where should we start you know neural networks always involve uh, improving the previous settings of the weights so you can say this can be a good uh, starting point all right so that's what this title uh, title means greedy layer wise unsupervised pre training and just a little bit of a background for the unsupervised part supervised learning is easy to understand it's about well here is the input and here is the, here is uh, what is the label that should have and so please learn all the weights along the way and use back propagation to modify the weights okay that's well defined what about unsupervised i keep giving you samples process it what should i do there is no output given well in unsupervised learning what we try and do is we're going to capture a probability distribution of the data also using a statistical learning mechanism and what does happen there is we have a training objective we say that there are some parameters that describe this distribution <coughs> we'll start with some arbitrary setting for the parameters and uh, we should keep on improving those parameters until the probability distribution represented by those parameters is as accurate as possible and so the way we do it is we set up uh, a function which is actually uh, the likelihood function of the data and the likely likelihood function and the uh, distribution has some set of parameters so called weights and uh, we try to maximize that likelihood objective so we get the maximum likelihood objective so those weights of that network are now good at predicting the probability distribution associated for any input only thing is, is this is a deep learning network to learn the distribution so we're going to have not only the visible uh, layer the inputs x1 through xn but we'll also a set of a uh, set of uh, hidden units or latent units so we are going to have a joint distribution of the visible units and the hidden units so we call it as a joint distribution p of v comma h v is visible h is hidden so we would like this p of h comma v or v comma h to be uh, represented by a set of parameters and the parameters should be chosen such that it uh, reflects the data so of course we don't know what the values of h are so we talking about distribution of v the visible units p of v but p of v is expressed in terms of uh, the joint p of v and h and as you know uh, from bayes rule p of v comma h can be expressed in terms of the conditionals and marginals and so on so this unsupervised learning is a peculiar type of training it also involves uh, maximizing an objective function just like in in supervised learning we also or <coughs> uh, we define a loss function called the cross entropy and we say we should minimize the cross entropy of the sum of squared errors and choose the parameters such that that loss function is minimized so also in the case of unsupervised learning we now have a maximum likelihood criterion which we try to maximize by proper choice of the parameters so anyway that's a very very quick introduction to unsupervised learning using deep learning we'll spend more time on that
So we are now into this uh, section 15.1, which is uh, greedy layer wise unsupervised pre-training. So this slide simply tells you uh, the nature of pre-training as opposed to fine tuning. So pre-training says using data set A, train a model M. Model M is what? It's a neural network uh, and you have chosen certain uh, number of layers, a certain number of units per layer and uh, train it in the sense you start out with some setting for the uh, weights and then uh, you keep improving it and it represents the data set A. Uh, Pre-training is you have a data set B before training the model initialize some of the parameters of M with the model trained on A. So we do have a data set B which is what we are really interested in and uh, this says, well, at least use uh, the known data set A to train the model. Fine tuning is you train model, train M on B. So you, are, you have a good, a good starting point for B. And, uh, you know, presumably you don't have that much data on data set B. So essentially, this is pre-training and fine-tuning. Pre-training is training on, on uh, data set A and fine-tuning is on data set B. And uh, we can also regard this as a form of transfer learning. Transfer learning is, I'm learning, it, uh, I'm learning this whole network on, I get lots of pictures of cats and dogs. I suppose they're freely available. Everybody likes to look at those pictures on Facebook and other places, Instagram. You could uh, collect a data set like that and, and train a network, but then you are really interested in something more complicated. Uh, let's say ants and wasps. Uh, you really are interested in the ants and wasps, but you don't have that much data on it. And so this network that's been trained on dogs and cats can be the starting point and say, well, now can you fine tune it for wasps and ants. So that's, that's called transfer learning. So, you know, in, in this section, they're talking about greedy uh, uh, pre-training. There's a bit of a historical topic. This is where deep learning got a renaissance about five, six years ago. And so, it's always useful to think back as to what was the thinking going on. You might say, well, do I still use it today? The answer is there are more sophisticated methods today. You don't do a layer by layer training because you, you train, train it all at a time. But I think it's of great value to know what's going on in each layer because it's learning a representation and see what that means. And I think uh, since we're talking about a research topic now, I think it's definitely worthwhile to know this rather than simply saying, give me the final package, which doesn't use uh, layer wise. Uh, so so that's why, that's why we refer to a little bit of the uh, historical antecedent. The historical means five years old. So unsupervised learning played key historical role in revival of deep neural networks. Sir, I think you are not uh, displaying 15.1. Uh, oh, it's not displaying 15.1? Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, okay. Oh. You know what is happening is when I shared it, yeah, uh, it uh, kept thinking that's what I shared. Okay, I'm going to close that. Okay. Yes, sir. You can close 15.0 and open. Ah, okay. Yeah, I'm glad you brought it to my attention. Mm -hmm. and, Thank uh, you. Sir. I can do that. Yeah, I appreciate uh, your uh, bringing up these points. Uh, and I need to become a little more familiar with how to interact with you all. Okay. No problem, sir. It's okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Sure. Okay. It's okay now? Yes, sir. All right. Thank okay. You, I'm sorry. I missed these slides for you. Uh, no, okay. No We're problem. doing greedy layer wise unsupervised pre training. And the next one is table of contents. And uh, we are in 15.1 uh, greedy layer wise. And then we are, we just finished the slide number three of this uh, slide deck, which is pre, what's the difference between pre-training and fine tuning. I explained that uh, we pre-train on a data set A and then we fine tune on data set B. And that's where I was giving examples of cats and dogs versus uh, ants and wasps. 
Uh, okay, so let's move on to slide number four about uh, how uh, unsupervised learning played a key historical role uh, and it allowed uh, deep supervised networks without requiring art architectural specialization. So that is how people were doing it before the specializations such as CNNs and RNNs came along. And, and this was called as unsupervised pre-training or more precisely greedy layer-wise unsupervised pre-training. So this is greedy, layer by layer, layer wise we're training and it is unsupervised and it is pre-training. So this is kind of, it's nice to know this because you know, in your own uh, endeavors of trying out ideas, you might try out the simpler ideas first because what has happened is some of the latest, later ideas uh, become so sophisticated and they have, you already got pre-trained models available. There's really nothing much to do other than run it on the data set. So, uh, but if you really want to know what goes on underneath and how did they came up with it, this is what you need to learn. Okay, this slide is simply uh, uh, an explanation of what's a greedy algorithm. Those of you who are computer science people have uh, come across greedy algorithms before. Greedy algorithms break a problem into many components, then solve for the optima, optimal version of each component in isolation. It says, this is too complicated a problem. I'll break it into five parts and get the best solution to part one, best solution to part two and part three. That's a greedy approach because uh, you really should be looking at the interaction of all the parts. And that makes too complicated. But one, one, of the, the one, one approach is to solve them separately. Unfortunately, combining the individually optimal components is not guaranteed to yield an optimal complete solution. So that's the nature of greed. So greedy layer-wise unsupervised pre-training is a representation learned for one task, unsupervised learning, which captures the shape of the input distribution. Okay, that's an interesting thing. What does unsupervised learning learn? So it learns that ah, oh, this data has, uh, you know, it's a Gaussian distribution, or it's got, it's a, bi, uh, it's it's got a bimodal Gaussian. It's got two Gaussians in it, like uppercase letters and lowercase letters form two, two modes of a Gaussian distribution, huh? or yeah, bimodal Gaussian distribution, or it is ten, uh, you know, it's got ten modes corresponding to the ten digits, like that. So it learns the shape of the distribution. That is, we got these peaks and uh, corresponding to different subclasses. Uh, and uh, this representation is used for another task and supervised learning with the same input domain. So we're using for a different task. Maybe we, uh, we learned the task for the purpose of uh, part of speech tagging in natural language, and then you are using it for sentiment analysis. So that would be same domain, it's about natural language, but we're using it in a different task. And uh, greedy layer-wise pre-training relies on a single layer representation learning. It says, can we just learn one layer at a time? So single layer representation learning methods need a need a method that, that is able to learn a single layer. And what are some examples of, uh, supposing you say, I will just learn a single layer. Uh, here are a few examples that are given in this slide. The first one is called an RBM, or a restricted Boltzmann machine, right? All it is is a Markov network. Those of you who are familiar with probabilistic graphical models may remember that uh, probabilistic graphical models can be either directed or undirected graphs, and Markov networks are undirected graphs. And uh, a whole set of nodes can be connected in whatever way you want, which shows all the dependencies between the variables. That particular network represents the probability distribution of that set of variables and we would associate um, uh, associate probabilities, uh, or in this case, uh, in a Markov network, we don't get probabilities. We, we associate what are called as uh, factors, and uh, these factors together define the joint probability distribution. So any probability distribution involving any set of variables can be drawn as a Markov network. 
and uh, we just need to learn the appropriate parameters corresponding to what are called as the clicks in that graph and uh, together the clicks uh, associated with them are certain uh, weights and uh, those weights together define the probability distribution using what's called as a Gibbs distribution. So we, we, we end up defining what's called as a partition function uh, as well, given the set of, set of parameters uh, associated with every click in the graph, we have defined a probability distribution. So that's called as a Markov network, which is also referred to as a Boltzmann machine. Where did the, the name Boltzmann come in from? Uh, Boltzmann was a physics guy and uh, he, he did a lot of the early stuff on thermodynamics and they were also interested in statistical physics and they were talking about atoms and uh, the, the statistical distribution of the spin of the atoms and the atoms can would have uh, you know, spin in one direction or the other they were binary variables and they were interested in defining probability distributions associated with atoms and so Boltzmann did the early work and uh, that turns out to be useful in uh, deep learning. And uh, we have here, in this first diagram here, an RBM, a restricted Boltzmann machine. Boltzmann machine is a bunch of nodes connected every which way. Restricted says, no, no, you can't connect them every which way. You have a layer at the bottom called visible, visible nodes. And you have a bunch of nodes at the upper level called hidden nodes. So we have V's and H's here. The connections go on, only go from V's to H's and no other way. So Jeffrey Hinton was the first one to say, I'm going to call this a restricted Boltzmann machine because there's a restriction on the kinds of connections that are possible, but it's still a Boltzmann machine. And all it is a, is a Markov network. And we can have a joint probability distribution defined over all these nodes exactly like this. So we can say a neural network can be viewed as a generative model. It's a probability distribution, which only has some visible nodes and it also has some hidden nodes. You can have several layers of them. But anyway, in this case, a single layer representation is only one layer of hidden. And another possible uh, single layer representation for the purpose of this uh, chapter is an autoencoder. We spend a lot of time on autoencoders. We have the input coming in and here is the output, reconstructed output, in between there's a hidden layer. So it's about, so we can say the layer wise training could also apply to an autoencoder to learn one layer. An RBM is to learn one layer here. And we could also think of a sparse coding model where some of the nodes of an autoencoder are set to, are not used. This, this one involves three layers in a sparse coder. Uh, what if we had only one layer? There would be a sparse coding model with one layer. So anyway, single layer representation learning is uh, any of these things, RBM, uh, autoencoder, sparse coding model, and so on. So uh, single layer pre-training, each layer is pre-trained using unsupervised learning. Taking the output of the previous layer and producing as output a new representation of data whose uh, distribution or relation to categories is simpler. So there is one layer here and that's what we're trying to train. And actually uh, this is uh, training a four layer network using greedy uh, greedy uh, learning. So this is uh, a network with uh, three hidden layers here. And first hidden layer pre-training. And then second hidden layer pre-training, we involve these two. So first we involve only the, uh, the input in the next stage. If it is unsupervised, we don't even have an output. So we're just trying to model the distribution here. But if you're using an autoencoder, we'd say, well, that's the encoding and the autoencoder would have to reproduce it. So a four layer network is trained by first learning the first hidden layer and then learning the second hidden layer, then learning the third hidden layer and then uh, fine tuning of the whole network. So they said, okay, we've learned it all on a particular data set and then uh, we can fine tune it 
using the idea we just talked about where so this was the idea this is a a bit like you know in the stone age how did they how did they do this well this is what they did they trained them layer by layer by layer separately and built a whole thing and then they said okay there it is we have trained it on a particular task and see how well it does right today we don't do that today what we'd say is if do you really want those three layers okay put it in and then uh, we will uh, subject the whole thing to a backward error propagation it will learn all these uh, together and uh, we just said by uh, being greedy you're not going to do as well as by looking at all of them simultaneously so even though we know that that is the correct way to do it but this is how we did it uh, training them layer by layer and you can see what it is that they're going to be learning and how they're going to be influencing each other so here is the formal algorithm for greedy layer wise unsupervised pre training protocol okay it shows all the steps of uh, it see you have the uh, we have the uh, part where we are doing uh, the learning going on here for uh, m layers here and that is the pre training and then there is the fine tuning part here so there's a pre training part and the fine tuning part so anyway there is the full algorithm for somebody who wanted to look at the code of what that looks like so a little bit more about the history layer wise unsupervised unsupervised greedy layer wise training was used to side step difficulty of training layers of a deep neural net for a supervised task so this is a, a few years ago when computing was not as ubiquitous and uh, computing power like gpus were not as easily available and uh, so this is how you could do layer by layer you train each layer separately and then go on and there was a famous method called neocognitron as old as 1975 and then deep learning renaissance of 2006 began with uh, greedy learning to find initialization for all layers and earlier on only deep Uh, CNNs were used, and today greedy layer-wise pre-training is not required to train fully connected deep networks. So you you train the whole thing because of availability of uh, you know GPUs. So again, greedy pre-training terminology it is we call it greedy because it uh, optimizes each piece of the solution independently. it is layer wise because independent pieces are the layers of the network training proceeds one layer at a time pre training it is only the first step before applying a joint training applied to fine tune all the layers together so another few comments greedy layer wise uh, pre training can yield substantial improvement for classification so it does quite well but occasionally it can be harmful so it is important to learn as to when it works and when not so this uh, these comments uh, apply only to greedy unsupervised pre training there are semi supervised learning paradigms also so unsupervised pre training combines two ideas initial parameters have a regularizing effect we have studied the topic of regularization early on in this uh, semester uh, there are so many methods of regularization and uh, by solving the problem on a, another data set which is plentifully available we achieve some regularization that is we don't overfit and one of which is approach one local minimum over another so some of the fears earlier on was there are so many minima in the loss function uh it's just impossible to uh, guarantee any global minimums so this may help you approach the correct global minimum but uh, today's understanding is that local minima are no longer considered serious so we've talked about that earlier on what if i ended up with a non local minimum it's not a serious issue because the complexity of the landscape and learning about a input distribution can help to learn about the mapping from inputs to outputs so uh, this unsupervised learning 
saying uh, that it can be a value because if you have just been training on lots of images of cars and motorcycles, quite well uh, learned that uh, they, uh, they have wheels on them. And the representation for wheels is useful for the supervised learner. Now we might be going on to a fine tuning classifier that is, uh, that is recognizing which model of car it is. Maybe we just have a few specialized models. And if it knows all about cars and motorcycles, it's gonna be useful over there. So that was the two ideas. And this is the, I think the last slide here, which says learning trajectories. Each, uh, here is an interesting looking graph. It's a very unusual graph here, where every point here corresponds to a neural network. An entire neural network is one point. And how do you get that point? This is a two dimensional space. They started out in some very, very high dimensional, infinite dimensional space, where uh, each neural network would be characterized by what it does for any input and output. So you would have, uh, for an input X, it produces output Y. So you will have to have all possible inputs and then all the corresponding outputs. So a neural network is one of those points that assigns these inputs to uh, this possible set of outputs. And so every classifier would be a different one of those points. That sounds like a horrendous problem to characterize all pos a neural network by a point and by characterizing all possible neural networks. And then you are mapping that into a two dimensional space. And now we're saying each one of these points is a neural network. And so when you keep training these neural networks, it becomes a different point. So it could be moving along some manifold over here. And uh, so they're showing that with pre-training, you're going to be somewhere here. Without pre-training, you're going to be here. And they're showing after some number of iterations. The colors indicate time. So it keeps changing from here to here to here. So this is saying, that with pre-training you are in a different part here and uh, without pre-training you are a different part here. So it's saying uh, that uh, it's not one and the same. So you're kind of biasing it towards something else. So it's, it's an interesting point. Why is this interesting? Is uh, because we do uh, pre-training quite a bit. You know, today, if you want to do natural language processing, you don't have to do any of that, uh, you know, uh, learning the embeddings and so on on your own. You know, it's all available. Even for images, it's all available. Dogs and cats and whatnot, it's all available. It's all been pre-trained for you. You just take the weights and apply it to whatever problem you want to apply it to. But this is pointing out a danger that the pre-training is ending up with a network in another part of the space. If you had really trained on only your data, you might actually do uh, differently. So anyway, that's what, that's what this part is. So this uh, section 15.1 is about a historical topic. And you can say, well, I'm going to ignore history. I just want the current. Well, okay, so be it. But I think it's an interesting topic because uh, you could say that would be my natural thinking to learn these layers layer by layer. And I would also think about using unsupervised learning and supervised learning. And I'd also think about pre-training and fine tuning. So it's bringing all these elementary concepts into one place. So if you want a good understanding of deep learning, this is a good chapter to, to uh, learn from, okay? And uh, we are going to go into uh, some more detailed stuff on, I believe next one is going to be on distributed representation and then to uh, uh, disentangling factors. That's, that seems to be a really, really fascinating topic. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. As you can see, I've been changing my setting every time. I'm getting feedback from some of you as to what setting works better and so on.
and uh, I'm also learning how to do this kind of teaching. So you can send me offline or whatever feedback as to uh, how we can make our lectures better. Okay. All right. Are there any questions? Okay. So if not, uh, that's the end of class for today. And uh, I will uh, meet you again on Monday, which is going to be during the month of uh, May, I suppose. Yeah. So see you on the first Monday of May.